premiere here at Baker Central uh, 667 Young Street on the second floor for part of the Karma Cup Speaker Series. We're at Baker Central 2018 Karma Cup Speaker Series. A few people in this room may uh, very much know our next guest speaker. Um, you may know her if you visited one of Toronto's uh, local vapor lounges. Um, she used to be a bong tender just like the rest of us. Um, and then, you know, took a, with a passion for cannabis photography and social media and has now organically grown her followers to over 42,000 followers and has spent the last year turning her love of cannabis into a career. Um, she most recently has uh, taken a contract as uh, helping with product development at Seven Acres Supreme, helping their new recreational line. And uh, she is one of the most awesome people to follow on Instagram and Snapchat if you love cannabis. So uh, very, very excited to talk, to present to you and as part of the can Karma Cup speaker series. For those of you watching online, um, you may not know her. Marley, also known as Tweedledoob. So we can put this, you can sit at a table, you can sit anywhere you want. Thank you so much, Tracy, yeah. for that lovely do you, introduction. Do you need a vape pen? Do you need a, do you need a volcano? I would you, love a vape pen. How about a shatterizer? Shatterizer do? Sure, whatever right. you got. I've been um, at the Karma Cup Festival actually all day so far, just working at um, the Seven Acres Lounge. So I've been talking all day and not smoking. So I could use a toke and some water, I think, before I do this. Um, so I'm really excited to be here to ta uh, talk to you guys today about social media. I actually did my very first public speaking yesterday at a conference. Um, I was talking about social media at the Grow Up Conference in Niagara Falls. And um, I don't know if some of you are expecting to see Jack Lloyd here today, the lawyer, but he was unable to make it from Vancouver. So Tracy asked me to come last minute and uh, fill in. So I'm going to talk to you mostly the same talk that I did yesterday, except that was to a room half full of suits. So I'm gonna like modify it a little for you real cannabis people. Um, as Tracy said, my name's Marley. Some of you might know me more as Tweedledoob. Um, if I had known that I'd be called my Instagram name in real life so much, I probably would have chosen something a little bit less ridiculous, but it is too late now. Um, so over the last three years um, since I started my Instagram account, I have, as Tracy said, organically gained about 42,000 followers. Um, I started out in the industry working in a cannabis lounge just like this called Vape on the Lake in Etobicoke. Um, at that time, I uh, was going to the U of T full time and social media wasn't really my thing at all. It was not on my radar. Um, but so even I'm kind of shocked that I've gone from being like terrified of social media to smoking weed on the internet just for fun and kind of turn that into a viable career path. I did not really see it coming, but I couldn't be more excited about what's happening in the industry right now. Um, so, dee -dee 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 -dee. I can skip over that part for the thing. All right, oh, thank you, Tracy. No worries. Um, I don't have to explain to you guys what a vapor lounge is since we're sitting in one, but I didn't know that they existed until I moved to Toronto in 2012. Um, I'm from Alberta. At the time, I had already smoked weed for about 10 years, but I had no idea that Toronto had such a vibrant and active cannabis community. And um, I really didn't think I was gonna like Toronto when I moved here, but it was really the community that made me fall in love with it, and that's why I'm still here um, six years later. So um, we can kind of fast forward my first two years working at the Vapor Lounge, if we're focusing on social media here. Um, I, do you guys know Spliffs McKenzie? I don't know, anybody knows Spliffs McKenzie? Awesome, so today she has about 60,000 Instagram followers. Uh, in 2014, she started working at Vape on the Lake and she had about 10,000 Instagram followers. 
kept like coaxing me, try to make me make an account. And I was like, I resisted for months. We talked about it a lot. And I was just like, it, I just remember the physical feeling of anxiety I used to get thinking about posting myself online smoking weed. It just made me very uncomfortable. Um, I'd already smoked for 10 years basically supervised uh, Toronto stoners at the lounge for two years. Uh, did I say that right? I smoked for 10 years. I worked at the lounge for two years. Very comfortable walking down the street smoking weed. But like I said, the whole idea of cannabis social media, you're amazing. Thank you, Gareth. <sighs> oh, that didn't even really work. There we go. Okay, so um, Spliffs eventually convinced me to make an Instagram account. And for the first whole year, I wanted it to be cannabis focused, but I was still too paranoid to post anything about myself really at all. So I knew that I had a pretty cool job working at the lounge. Not a lot of people get to go to work and like smoke joints and clean bongs. So I knew that was something that was kind of different that I could post about. Um, but it actually took me, the thing that really made me push to post more about myself and force myself to kind of get comfortable with posting selfies and posting more about my life was interviewing um, Sarah Hanlon for the cover of High Canada Magazine in 2016. Sarah Hanlon fans in the house? Yeah, hell yeah, she's the best. Um, so as some of you obviously know, she uh, went into the Big Brother Canada house in 2015, and that was right around the time when I started my account, and I was super inspired by her. If you scroll way back in my Instagram feed, you'll see that some of my first posts were about Sarah and how cool it was that somebody that worked in a vapor lounge is on national, this vapor lounge, this very lounge, um, she's on national TV, talking about cannabis, talking about the lounge, totally normalizing it. And not only did Global kind of like accept that and like, yeah, they called her a employee and people were across, in Toronto, I think enough people know about the lounges, but across Canada, kind of outside Vancouver and Toronto, the vapor lounge or the cannabis lounge is a totally novel thing. People don't know that it exists at all. So it's so exciting to see her just be open about it and really to be like she was one of Canada's favorite players she was like beloved for her strategy her humor her social game and she wasn't seen as like the stoner in a bad way it was kind of the most active breaking the stigma that I had really ever seen and in talking to her um, I didn't interview her for about a year after she got out of the big brother house but I remember her telling me, like, you know what? People didn't go up to my grandmother um, while I was on the show and say, oh, your daughter's such a stoner, weed's bad. Or they would go and say, hey, your granddaughter's amazing. She's doing so great. Like, the fact that she was open about cannabis wasn't as divisive as people kind of think. Like, I think sometimes as cannabis users, we expect to be judged and expect people to only see us for that and if they don't like weed they're not going to like us but I think people are sort of starting to come around to it and it's if you can show that you're not just a lazy stoner that sits in the basement all day if you can actually show that you're you know a productive member of society and also a cannabis user I think that's like really inspiring and really productive for kind of the movement um so I'm wondering I don't know how into participation you guys are right now, but I'm wondering if you guys wanna put up your hands if you are, a, you're obviously a cannabis user, but if you're like open about it and people in your life know that you smoke weed, are you loud and proud or are you kinda, okay, so maybe like half and half. Um, I think that there's for sure a lot of totally reasonable reasons why people are not open about their use whether it's your job or your family or whatever, I think it's, it makes a lot of sense for some people that they can't just talk about it. Um, but some of you that didn't put up your hands were probably like me and really just internalized the stigma. So I was really concerned about people like discrediting me for like just being a pothead. And I didn't want people to see me like that. 
And after talking to Sarah, I kind of started to realize like, you know what, that mindset is actually perpetuating the stigma. Like I'm not doing anybody any favors here. So if I know that like, like I was going to one of the best universities in Canada and working full time or working part time and like doing all these things that I think the average person would think is like, you know, I'm doing all right. I'm not just sleeping all day, but I still, it took time to sort of get used to being public about it and putting stuff online. But um, like coming out of the cannabis closet was actually a huge turning point for me. Um, and I obviously wouldn't be here today talking to you guys if I was still really concerned about being judged for how much I love weed, which is a lot. Um, so hang on one second. Hi, Rena. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Amazing. That's perfect. Um, okay. So So after my first year or so, I think I had about a thousand Instagram followers. And when I started to not just post more pictures of myself, but post more about myself and my life and what I was kind of up to, I think that's when I really started to gain momentum. And as things started to take off, I started taking it a bit more seriously and putting more time into it. And there's not really one thing that was like, this was a turning point and then I blew up. It was kind of like this gradual kind of gaining of momentum. And I think there was kind of this magic storm of a bunch of different things that helped that happen. Um, one of the things I think is that like, I don't know if you guys can kind of relate to this, but there's like some um, accounts online, not just cannabis accounts, but if they just post pictures, like you kind of see it as an account. Like this is like a weed account and there's no face to it. There's no person. You're like, oh, I like the content, but you don't really, you don't connect with it because you don't know who they are or what they're all about. And I think I realized that in the way I consume Instagram content, the people that I like the most really share a lot about their own story and their journey. And the more that you kind of feel like you're getting a behind the scenes or you really get what this person's doing, you feel a lot more connected. And so the more I started, more I started putting myself out there, I was really connecting with people. And so it wasn't just gaining followers that like just as a number, I was sort of starting to gain connections with the cannabis community in Toronto, across Canada, and in the States and around the world. Somehow, of my 42,000 followers, only about half of them are in North America. So there's like 20,000 people internationally that follow me as well. So knowing that, I really try to like showcase um, Toronto's community because I think it's so powerful. Like the fact that we're all sitting here in a room and can like be open about our cannabis use and vape and just hang out. I think that's a really novel thing across Canada, but more so internationally. So being able to use social media to kind of normalize cannabis and to show what it could be is like super exciting to me. Um, so around the same time, maybe just, yeah, 2016 or so, I started using, uh, learning to use my camera manually. Um, I would say I taught myself, but really YouTube taught me. Um, if anybody has a camera that they don't really know how to use, I'm telling you, go to YouTube and just search your model of camera or search different um, things you want to learn about and it is all right there. A million different people make tutorials and it's, you can totally get into it that way. Um, so as the quality of my photos started to improve, I started to get reposted by some really big accounts, which is really huge for um, momentum. And also I started to get hired by local cannabis brands to do um, product photography and event photography. Um, two years ago I started, one of my first like big gigs was actually working for the Karma Cup, doing social media and photography. Um, so yeah, I think those kinds of things have sort of helped me gained a little bit of, gain a little bit of credibility and I was still working at the lounge full time, but being able to like start making money by doing photography and sort of freelance cannabis stuff was really motivating for me and really exciting. 
I've really struggled my whole life with like what I want to do with my life. I've been kind of searching for something forever. And so getting more and more into the cannabis community and industry has really helped me feel a bit better about that. Like even though I still don't know exactly what my like career is going to be or what I'm going to do in five or 10 years, just the cannabis community has given me the confidence that I know like this is the place that I want to be. And if I just keep doing what I'm doing and keep kind of pushing, then I'll figure it out. So I think that's, um, yeah. So uh, the next kind of game changer really with Instagram for me was um, the addition of video. So there was a time that Instagram stories did not exist. And when they first came out, uh, video stuff made me very uncomfortable. I would just like get all weird and nervous and not really do it. But I realized that it's actually a very, very effective way of communicating. I could write a big whole long caption on a photo and like not everybody's going to read it for one. But people that do read it. Writing inevitably leaves something up for interpretation. So we have to interpret the tone. We may not get the kind of nuance. You don't know what people are really taking away. And in video, I can, you know, in 10 or 15 seconds, I can say something. People can see me and hear me and get the tone and expression. And I think it's a lot easier to connect with people. And it kind of goes back to contributing to, like, people seeing me as a person and like not just a weed account. And so I think that's helped people kind of relate to me and connect to me. Um, blah, blah, blah. So I don't know exactly when I like became an influencer. There's no really clear definition of the term. And it has always felt lame to refer to myself as one, but People message me all the time um, asking to promote their brand. So I guess that's kind of boils down to what it is. So whatever. Um, monetizing my social media has always been something I've wanted to do. Like who doesn't like money? Um, but I've been really hesitant about how I go about it. Um, for example, people asking me to promote their like China glass or some edible that I've never tried or never heard of or whatever. I'm very skeptical because A, I don't know about the product and I can't vouch for it. And two, if I don't know the people, I'm not confident. I don't want somebody that I suggest to try a brand to have a bad experience. And literally that's all it takes is like one time you should tell people to go to this website and it's sketchy or whatever. People have a bad experience one time. I think it's like can do irreparable damage really to your reputation and online that's kind of all you have really. So the like my integrity and kind of the earned trust of my followers is like very important to me. Um, so it's made monetizing it somewhat difficult. I turn down most of the offers that people make me. Uh, makes me wish that it, Instagram was more like YouTube where you get paid for views and it's just easy. But I mean, for Instagram, you could have 50,000 followers and like if you don't have the hustle, like you're not making any money. I think people kind of, there's some misconceptions. People think, you know, or if you have 100,000 followers, you might must be rich. But it's like, no, you still have to work and like figure out how you're going to make money. You have an audience, but it's not like a guaranteed income in any way. Um, so yeah, the whole influencer thing can be kind of... Um, a challenging thing to navigate right now because it is so new. Um, but I think like we're going to see it get more sort of standardized or formalized and there's going to be a lot more money in social media ad campaigns from like huge corporations. I mean, they're already seeing um, traditional like print and TV advertising decline a lot. And we watch or we use social media pretty much like we used to watch TV, right? I know that's kind of how I watch Instagram stories. It's like keeping up with all my favorite TV shows, but like they're real people. So it's so much more, it's that much more entertaining or like exciting. Um, okay, I think that's pretty much like my story part of it. 
I have a few points, um, sort of some takeaway tips for there's no real formula, there's no one way to like gain Instagram followers or to like become an influencer or anything, but I think these are just a few things that for me have really helped kind of along the way. Uh, the first thing I wanna talk about is content um, because really without content, like what are we even talking about? Um, there's a lot that could be said here and if you guys have any specific questions about content or Instagram or social media, I would really like for you to ask them. So there's a lot to be said, but I'm just going to focus on one kind of key thing, which I think is um, storytelling. I think like humans love stories. We're told bedtime stories from before we can even talk. We watch movies, we watch TV, we read books, we love to gossip, we love to share things that happen to us in our day. Like, stories are a very like basic unit of communication that we use all the time. And so, um, like I said, I watch Instagram stories sort of like TV. So you get to see people's, these little snippets of all these little stories every day. But if you follow somebody for long enough, you sort of start to see the big picture story. And I think we're like, the power kind of is, is in getting people kind of like along with your story and with your journey. And that really helps people, I think, like feel connected to you and like know you and understand you a little bit more. Um, for example, even yesterday I was posting about doing my first like public speaking thing. And people that have followed me for years, I got tons of incredibly kind and supportive messages from people. And like people that I've never met in countries who knows where being like telling me that they're like so proud of me. And it's so cool. Like it's such a crazy thing to feel that like these people, like they know my story. I don't know them, you know, but like I've put enough out there. And if you kind of are following along and seeing somebody's journey as it unfolds, I think it's a, I think it's a powerful kind of tool. So what's kind of awesome about this is I had questions printed for you <laughs> and, and you pretty much answered almost all of them. <laughs> awesome. Um, although there's a couple here. So um, how much time a day or a week do you dedicate to social media? <sighs> I've been spending less time doing it lately, as you mentioned. Um, I've recently gotten a contract to do some, some consulting for Supreme on their Seven Acres brand launch. And so I've been doing that for like 30 to 40 hours a week. And it's definitely cut into my Instagram time, that's for sure. <laughs> um, you know what? I've never really calculated it. I'm kind of like in the morning, I'll spend some time. And then throughout the day, I like to, I probably spend at least an hour a day, maybe split up over time. But... Mm -hmm. When I was first starting my account, um, maybe like winter 2016, kind of I was first getting into it, I was spending an obscene amount of time, obscene amount of time online, just I, engaging and connecting and getting into the whole thing. It was awesome to kind of hear your story because the funny thing is I remember the first time you messaged me, it was like, I kind of knew your account, I liked your name, it was kind of cool, blah, blah. <laughs> and then you messaged me and then once I met you, I was like, and it changed because once you know who you're following, their account becomes more interesting. For sure. Um, you, know, I, you know, I love some of the funny things you post. You post some great like Lego figures and weed and you've, like, you post some awesome little stories and awesome little Thank photos. Um, but the, the you is what drew me in. Mm. Um, and again, you mentioned Sarah Hanlon, who was awesome and uh, unfortunately she can't be here this weekend. Mm. But... Um, Again, that was one of the things that was great. It's like, you know, seeing her described as a hemp employee. Um, the realization of watching, she was, it was, a, it was a sign of a cultural shift because she was on sure. primetime TV, not after 11 o'clock, talking about cannabis and talking about what it was, was like to be a, a, a bud tender and a bong tender and what it was like to work in a, in a, in a kind of like a bar for weed and, and actually mm. see how much Canada loved her and supported her throughout that and, and how much global TV did too. It was really a sign of a cultural shift. And all she was doing 
was being herself in these fabulous gold pants. Right? Right? Like She always has the best <laughs> outfit. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if you haven't watched season three of Big Brother Canada, you, and because you think, you know, um, you, should, and you, you should definitely watch it, because it was one of those things where I watched it and I thought, People judge the stoner all the time, and there were people that were in the house that judged her. Oh yeah, but the majority of they Canada, were they discounted her in the first couple of weeks. They're like, oh yeah, like she's just the stoner. Like, don't worry about her. She's not a threat. And then she killed them. And and the amount of support that she had, not only in mm-hmm. this space, as we all watched her win um, in this space that the night she did it, but um, to realize when you start to realize that wait. Most of the stigma and the propaganda and everything else is because you've heard one person in 50 say it. Yeah. And, and they really, the people that are actually against us and against the money, they're actually the minority. They're just really freaking loud. Yeah, for um, sure. So don't pay attention. <laughs> um, uh, the other one is, is we've seen a lot of cannabis Instagram accounts get suspended. Um, do you take any precautions in keeping your safe or is there a way to make sure that, you know, you keep it safe? I like how you worded that because, <sighs> okay, so cannabis accounts are not protected by Instagram's terms and conditions. Mm-hmm. They uh, consider any cannabis content, even if it's completely legal where it's posted to be breaking the terms and conditions because it promotes the use or sale of drugs. But Instagram is not going through millions of accounts being like, oh, do you post about weed? Delete, delete, delete. Mm -hmm. It's 100% complaint based. So you have to have some haters reporting your account to get deleted. So my precaution that I take is like not being a dick. (laughs) I was like, don't be a dick. Um, And like if people like troll me, like there's haters now and again, like somebody just writing some like cheap comment or just like whatever. And like those people more than anything probably just need a hug or a friend. Like if you troll, they want you to react and they want to get into some like battle with you because they have nothing better to do. So if you don't engage with that and don't like fight back, you either, if it's something like disgusting and offensive, like delete it for sure. But if somebody has something to say that I can kind of like come back and be like, hey, like I'm sorry that you feel that way, but these are like the rational responses and kind of just like I've turned a lot of haters around. Yeah, I've actually, actually, so here's the deal. I've actually seen the way that you deal with people on your social media. I do not have that grace and poise. I, <laughs> at all, at all. I am very reactionary. But you, you actually, you do, and I've actually seen you turn around some people on, on some of your threads. And stuff I love like, it. So, some, some pretty... <laughs> Horrible haters that all of a sudden <laughs> became giant Tweedledee fans. You or they're just like, like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, if you want lessons in diplomacy, um, you certainly <laughs> want to check out your <laughs> Tweedledee's Instagram account. Uh, and if you want to see pictures of really great nugs as well and, and really what it's like to um, be at the forefront of the cannabis industry because you find yourself in a very, very... Um, awesome position right now that you've you're transitioning. You are doing what a lot of people in the industry are trying to do is you're transitioning from, an you know a semi quasi legal was it legal what is a job yep um, into this this new space where yeah, it's pretty crazy. You know, I think it's funny where you're like I'm not sure what my job's going to be. Social influencer might still be a career. Because you know, we 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 don't know where, who who it's thought true. it was who thought it was ever going to be one in the Not first me, place. For sure. So here we are, um, in in a in a space where where you know um, there will probably be more jobs as a social influencer that there may be cashiers in five years. You never know. Mm-hmm. Anybody else have any more questions for Tweedledee? Hey, or Marley. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Daniel from Dope Chef uh, Media. I ended, hi. Hi. Uh, I was wondering um, when you brought up that you'd get like uh, these companies that you don't know uh, asking you to, to do things. I, I was wondering like wh- what do they ask for and like what is their offer? There's a whole range there. It's interesting to see people's offers. She's a 
I mean, it depends. So a lot of the time people will just want to send me things for free for me to post about. And when I had like, it, that really started pretty much it, as soon as I hit 10,000 followers, people were like, hey, you want free stuff? And I'd be like, yeah, I'd love free stuff. And people would send me stuff. And then if I didn't like it, I wouldn't post about it. And then people, they'd be messaging me being like, oh, hey, you didn't shout us out. I'm like, oh, yeah, like your papers were pretty shit. Like I'm not going to, I don't really want to tell people to use them, right? And so after a few of those awkward encounters, I was like, I don't really want free stuff anymore unless it's something that I like really believe in or am actually going to use myself and I can legit just use it as I would and then be like, hey, yeah, this is a thing I'm using and it's not a cheesy sell or it's not whatever. I'm just saying, yeah, I like this product and I think that's like been a better way. Um, but I've res like somebody wanted to send me a free t-shirt, but I had to like sign a contract and I was like, yeah, no, nah. there's a full, a full, full, full range. Some people definitely offer to pay and there's a huge range of like what people are willing to pay. It's, it's really interesting. I think right now it's for me, um, I, you can like go on Instagram and become like a business account and you get a lot of insights and you, you see how many people viewed your pictures, how many people clicked on it, how many people whatever. And so that's a really good tool to be able to say like I have, I get this much reach on photos so it's worth at least this much, you know? But like, yeah. Does that answer your question? Okay, sweet. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay, see. <laughs> okay. All right. Yes, because the next, the next presenter is munchies. As I go for munchies, I should be hurting <laughs> my appetite. Um, thank you very, very much. I actually... Thank you. We've been friends for years, but there's actually parts of this story, her story, your story, that I didn't know. Really? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was kind of so awesome crazy. to listen to. Listen to him. And so if, you, uh, if you're on social media, check out Tweedledoop on, on Instagram and on Snapchat and on... Twitter uh, and uh, Facebook uh, and all Tumblr. Of the things. All of the things. All of the things. All of the things. And uh, she is definitely uh, moving and moving in the sphere of, uh, of the online world in a way that uh, most people don't actually get to see, so... Thank you, um, Tracy. Yeah. I also have Tweedledoob.com. Oh, yes. I, I have forgot. a blog, and I have a story. I sort of tell my story a little bit more in detail or a little bit differently on there. I also mm -hmm. have a blog about mental health yep. stuff, and I have a shop, and I have a gallery of a bunch of pictures, so there's lots, lots there. I was going to say, I forgot about the big cartel store. I was going to say, because yeah. you can get... Because here's the thing. There's, <laughs> there's a reason that the name Tweedledoob is 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 pretty right. So if you guys have ever seen the little jolly joint pins, that is also known got as a, a bunch in my purse too. That is also <laughs> known as a Tweedledoob pin. Um, and uh, if you're a fan of Beck or Roger James, the artist, uh, you will also know Marley quite well. Um, <laughs> he helps. She helps inspire some of his artwork, which is amazing. So thank yeah. you very much, Marley. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks. So we are going to take a little bit of a break while we get uh, ready for our next presenter. I hope you have the munchies, um, because next up we have uh, Rena from the High Society Supper Club, who will be cooking with cannabis today um, and uh, talking to you about how to microdose your cannabis into your daily meals. Um, so just stay tuned, and we'll be getting set up right up soon. Bye. And be down there for the vendors. There's, what, 60 to 80 vendors down there or something? Uh, there's going to be live art. There's going to be live glass blowing. There's music. Um, Weed. Lots of it. The festival is going to be off the hook. 